Hey everybody, hope you all are having a fantastic weekend wherever you are and this video is very long overdue. Wanted to get this out maybe a couple of months ago even, but the end of July and August month itself was very busy for myself so I was unable to do it unfortunately, but we're not going to get too deep into that. We're going to be talking today about the Rascal Does Not Dream of Lost Singer, the 10th volume in the Rascal Does Not Dream series. The light novel for this was great. It was fantastic. I absolutely loved it, especially the ending of it. If you caught my live streams of it, it was a very great read. I enjoyed the heck out of it. I loved the conversation that came out of it with people in the chat and it was a fun time. It was a very fun read and was a very great change of pace, at least to some extent. I, I've always felt like the Rascal Does Not Dream series has been a little bit more of a mature show considering the genre that it kind of falls under, maybe kind of slice of life-ish, or even rom-com-ish to an extent with some supernatural mystery thrown in the mix as well. But this story that we have here is the first light novel that we got after the time skip, moving from volume nine going on to volume 10, where we have these characters now in university. So definitely change of pace that we got here a little bit. Feels a little bit more mature. We got some great characters and stuff that we got introduced in the story. And then as well as setting up for a lot of things in the future, a lot of very thought provoking things that we got to look forward to and I'm enjoying the heck out of it. I'm here for it all. And we get to spend some good time with this character that has grown to be one of my personal favorites in Uzuki Hirokawa. Getting to see her mindset on things more when it comes to her career and her friends, getting to see her interact more with other students in Sakata. But it was definitely great to see her move up to the forefront and getting a lot of much needed time from her as a character and seeing her struggles that she deals with, her worries that she has with her career, with the idol group that they have there as well, which was a big theme of this story with uncertainty and being scared of what the future holds or just worried that things might not work out the way that they really want them to work out. And that's always a scare for a lot of people in life, you know, but you gotta make the best of it. And I thought that this was great and striving for your dreams in this way that they do is awesome to see. But yeah, let's jump into things. So the story kind of kicks off with Sakata being at this kind of little event party thing that is for the purpose of having these college students, these university students get to know each other. So it's a place where they go and kind of mingle and everything and talk to each other, get to know each other and build some sort of like relationships or camaraderie, whatever it may be. And he's just sitting there chilling and he's drinking something. I can't remember he had a drink and he was like snacking on some stuff. And there was a certain character that comes and joins Sakata at this table where he's enjoying some snacks and drinks and stuff. And I'd say that this character is very present throughout a lot of this light novel. I'd say throughout like maybe 40% of the light novel, we see her and you're reading it, she's present through a lot of this and having tons of conversation with Sakata and then other characters as well. And it was almost as if, it felt like almost like this light novel was catered to this character in particular, at least throughout that portion of the story, maybe like 40 to like almost halfway through this light novel. And this character is Miyori Mito, I'll go ahead and say it. So this character, Miyori Mito, is a very cute girl that goes to university as well with Sakta. That's why she was at this university little gathering and stuff that they had with their class. And she was in a very strange situation or a very uncomfortable situation for herself while these other people that were around there, Sakata was just enjoying himself and he doesn't want to get too deep into having conversations with other people and there's guys and girls trying to mingle with each other and possibly, you know, get each other's numbers and drinking together and it might turn into something a little bit weird or whatever. But it was that type of situation. It was that type of vibe while they were there, at least in some areas of this place that they were at. So Sakata, you know, kind of put himself away from that situation and was just enjoying some stuff. And then that girl, she was at one of those tables where that type of activity was going on at. And she decided like, you know, I don't wanna be a part of this. This is something that's gonna make me very uncomfortable. I don't want to 
have people asking me for my number or whatever it may be, or just trying to, you know, have that sort of conversation or make it lead somewhere else. So she's like, I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to go somewhere else where another person is at, where I can maybe fake it to have a conversation or fake being a friend to this person or whatever. So these people don't bother me anymore. She picked the perfect person in Sakata because he's kind of doing the same thing. He wants to kind of stay away from that sort of activity and everything. So yeah, Miyori Mito sits down with Sakata and they start having a nice conversation, a lot of little banter going on and everything and she was a very smooth talker I would say and they showed a picture of her and I'll put it somewhere on screen here and I say that this picture here I thought at first when I first saw this picture that this was like Uzuki Hirokawa or something and you probably heard me say that in like previous videos or like in a previous video at some point I thought this was her but the dead giveaway that it wasn't Uzuki Hirokawa is that she has a cute little mole on her face and I should have caught that that, that is not Uzuki so this is a new character and it's a character that does, I mentioned this in the stream, look like a lot of the other girls in the story. It looks a little bit like Shoko, looks a little bit like Mai Sakurajima, looks a little bit like somebody else that I'm just forgetting or whatever. But there's a lot of girls in this series that do have that same sort of look where they have like the long, like black-ish kind of hair, it's kind of like pale skin, just it look really pretty, whatever it may be. So we got another character that kind of fits the bill there too. She is very cool. She had a really nice conversation with Sakata and then I believe they left after that together and they kind of went their separate ways after that point but they became kind of acquaintances slash friends at that moment it was nice of him to let her kind of sit there and just have some conversation get away from that little situation that she was in at that time before she came over there to Sakata and yeah so that was kind of how things kicked off in this character like I said Miyori Mito was very prevalent she had lots of conversations with Sakata she talked to Uzuki Hirokawa at some point and she even became friends with my Sakurajima as well it was a little bit of a weird scenario on how that happened. It was very unexpected on Sakata's part, but it just ended up happening. One thing that I did forget to mention about Miyori Mito, this might be like super random, but one thing that her and Sakata did bond over was the fact that she also does not have a cell phone. Like I said, very random, but something that was very funny to find out about and a nice little bonding point between the two. And we also get introduced to another new character and his name is Takumi Fukuyama. So he is Sakata's like university, Yokohama University, new best friend or new good friend that he has there. And this person I would describe as like one of those desperate people that just want companionship in some sort of way. He's, he's a guy and he wants a girlfriend really bad. And he's, he's pretty down bad right now and he wants a girlfriend and he's asking Sakata constantly like, hey, why did you talk to this girl? Or like, how can I get a girlfriend as pretty as my Sakata like a famous person like that or whatever it may be. Or do you know any girls that might be interested in me or something along those lines? And like I said, he sounds very desperate for companionship and we'll see if that ever happens if he ends up getting a girlfriend or something like that. But he is sometimes some comedic relief within the light novel, uh, but also a little bit like, all right, guy, come on, like, let's have a normal conversation for once. Also, at the same time, I'll jump over to a little bit of the differences with uh, kind of like the light novel itself to at least one aspect of the differences that we do see with it, which is change of scenery when it comes to the series. When we read the light novels or we read them before and we see the anime and things like that, uh, focus is put on the travel around the area and destinations and stuff and places that we're going within the series like you're getting on this train and then you're going to this location or you're passing by these various scenery places or locations or things like that and it's always going to like school or Sakata going with Miwako somewhere or him going to work or whatever it may have been or him going with uh, my Sakurajima somewhere but at this point it's changed from him always getting on the same place or the same train to go to Minagahara High it's him going a different route going on different trains to end up going to the Yokohama City University that he's going to now which of course is a different setting he's going to university now in not Minagahara High not high school anymore so his traveling of course is different so he's getting on a different train like I said and it explains all of that and it explains as well as the different pieces of scenery that he passes by versus what he used to before when he went to Minagahara High so now he's seeing different things but he's got a routine going and he is pretty much used to it at this point now and it's been a year and a half I believe they said which is a little bit longer than what I thought that it was I thought it was only maybe like a 
year or so, but it's been almost two years now. So these characters are a bit older than what I thought that they were going to be like. For example, I believe that they mentioned at some point in this light novel that Tomoe Koga, she's coming up on her graduation of her third year. So she's almost done with high school too. But also I wanted to jump over to another little difference that we got when it came to locations and stuff like that. When I first was walking into this light novel and even before I walked into it, I had the hunch or whatever, I had the expectation that we were going to get to see the mother and father like in a different light. We get to see Sakata a little bit more present with the parents or Kaede more present with the parents or both of them, like I said, to have all of them living under one roof essentially and we get to see a little bit more interactions between all of them and how they kind of function as a family and things of that nature. But we really didn't get that in this light novel considering the circumstances at hand since Sakta is now in university, he is an adult now, he's working, he's doing a teaching job and stuff as well. So that kind of stuff came into play with this. So Sakata is still living by himself. He's still living at the same apartment that he was residing at before when Kaede was living there with him and the mom and dad are still living at the apartment that they were before during the time where Sakata's father was watching over the mother there. So they still live separately, which was, like I said, something I wasn't expecting. I didn't think that they were gonna live separately. I thought they were going to move all under one roof, but that didn't happen. Kaede at the moment, she is bouncing back and forth between each location. She wants to spend time with the mother and father, but also isn't gonna just abandon Sakata and she's lived with him for so long. So I'm sure that she is just so accustomed to being there with him. So right now she's living at Sakata's for a few days and then she'll go and bounce over to the mother and father's over there and live over there for a few days. And that works out well for her because she is doing the remote and online schooling right now. So she can kind of just go up and go to this place or go to this place and do her schooling, do her school work as she needs to. So that works out well for her. So we did get a little bit more of their family dynamic in that aspect, at least with the current state of things where, yeah, they're really not living together right now, Sakata and his parents. So I'm not sure what the relationship is like. I'm sure it's good. It's better after everything that's happened in the past couple of light novels that we've gotten. But moving on to elaborate a little bit on a topic that I just brought up not that long ago, and that was with Sakata being a teacher now. So he still has his old job with working at the restaurant, but he also has this side thing where he is a teacher, a tutor. So he's tutoring some students and stuff that need help on certain subjects. And they kind of elaborated a little bit, which was nice on how this tutoring thing works. So he only has two students at the moment and he is tutoring them in some sort of math kind of subject that they're doing right now, which a little bit of higher level math, of course, they're in university right now. Uh, but yeah, I was glad that they did elaborate on how things functioned for this kind of tutoring thing that he has going on because once they said that he had only two students under him I was like wait that's so little like how is he only tutoring two kids or whatever it may be or I thought he was going to be a teacher in a greater fashion in some sort of way you know but yeah they let us know that the way that it works is these students have to pick you as their tutor so they have to choose that so it's good for right now, he's starting off small. He is a tutor as of right now, starting out and everything. So he only has two students starting off, of course, a little bit slow, small, building up, hopefully to having more students in the future and then maybe becoming a teacher at, in a greater state at some point. But he has one student named Judy, who is a girl. And then we have another student named Kento Yamada, who is a boy. I can't remember what Judy's last name is or her first name. So we got those two characters there. And Judy seems very quiet, very proper, and kind of gets down to business and stuff when it comes to doing her work and listens and everything like she, you know, like a good student does. But then we have Kento Yamada and he's like the opposite of that. He's very crass. He says his mind and everything when it comes to things that he's thinking about. And he's really not there to study. He's there to really get advice from Sakta. I don't, I don't think that's his sole reason for being there, but a lot of what we see from him and talking to Sakata is mostly him just asking him about how to get a girlfriend. It very, very much reminded me of just that Takumi Fukuyama guy. So <laughs> he was like the younger version of that Fukuyama guy of being a desperate kind of teen or whatever in high school, wanting companionship, wanting a girlfriend and just wanting it for the wrong reasons and stuff, you know, at least this guy wanting it for, you know, like having a hot girlfriend or something. So like, I believe at one point he commented on 
Rio Futaba's boobs and everything. So like I said, being very crass and talking about it in that way and wanting just being very desperate in that way too. And Sakta giving him some sound, very good advice on telling him like, hey, like looks aren't everything. Personality is a very important part of things when it comes to wanting a girlfriend. So do you really wanna be with a girlfriend that you know you might not get along with or whatever, things of that nature. So good advice, like I said. So it was nice getting to see the dynamic between Sakta and his new students there and also getting to know a little bit more on how these personalities that they have for these two characters in Kento and Judy. And then as well as seeing a little bit more and having them explain and show you the reality, the dark reality of what kind of goes on as well when it comes to teaching in these schools. And they showed this girl who was in a situation with this teacher in a teacher student potential like romantic situation that was going on, you know, bad stuff where this dude is I don't know, trying to get with this girl like a freaking scumbag. He got caught for doing that or getting into some sort of situation with her. And he was like yelling, he was like, like, why are you doing this? I thought that you wanted me to help you with your personal problems or something like that as well. But you could tell that he was probably just trying to get out of the situation and everything, but he was getting into some sort of potential intimate or romantic relationship with his high school student. And that is very illegal, bad shit. Why is he doing that? He's a freaking douchebag for trying to partake in that kind of stuff. And the girl that he was involved with was Sara Himeji. So this is the first time that we end up seeing her. Sara Himeji comes into the story in this sort of way. So kind of seeing her introduced in this way tells us right off the bat that she's got some problems potentially, that she's, you know, this guy said that he wanted to help her with some potential problems and she's getting into some sort of sketchy situation with this older dude. And hopefully that doesn't turn out to be the situation that ends up with Sakata because in volume 12, we know that she is the main girl within that story. And it's called Rascal Does Not Dream of My Student. And it very much implies with the information that we got from it and the pictures that we got from it that she has a crush on Sakata. And they showed this whole little like four person little love triangle or love cycle thing that they showed in a picture and I'll put it somewhere on screen here. And these characters that we all have here, we know them now, now that we read this light novel. So we have the cycle went that this Kento Yamada guy likes Sara Himeji. And then Sara Himeji, or wait, how did it go? I think it went, this Judy girl likes Kento Yamada, and then Kento likes Sara Himeji, and then Sara Himeji likes Sakata. So it's like this little cycle thing that goes around, but not Sakata liking the Judy girl at the end of it, you know? So yeah, we have this little thing and we know all of the characters now. So that's really cool that we get to see these characters, at least in like a color page format or whatever that we saw in that picture, which is really nice. But yeah, we get introduced to Sara Himeji in this way. And then as well as I'll jump over to like related school things with tutoring and stuff, uh, Ryo Futaba, the reason why that she was mentioned by that guy Kento, the student that's being tutored by Sakata, is that she is also a tutor. So that was something that I was surprised at and very delighted to hear as well because of the fact that in volume eight and nine, I believe, we got some good information as to what the future plans were for these characters that we know and love and everything with Sakta, where he wanted to go. My Sakajima is going to university. Sakta's wanting to go to the same university. We got, um, I believe, Yunma Kunmi. He was going to be a firefighter and in firefighter training and stuff. And then other characters, you know, Kaide's going to be going to high school, things of that nature. But we didn't hear anything about Ryo Futaba. What was she going to do? What were her plans? What are her goals? What does she like have set in mind for her career and things of that nature. And yeah, we finally got it now, at least in some aspect that she is now a tutor in the future here after the one and a half year time skip that we got. So that's pretty cool. And knowing that she's like tied to Sakata still pretty closely and she's giving him a hard time as per usual, scolding him on different things that they got going on, telling him like, hey, make sure your students focus up and aren't freaking goofing off like that Kento guy, giving him a hard time too on kind of letting him know I believe she said this and very much so true when she did say it is that he is a lot more popular than what he thinks that he is. I can't remember what situation came about it. I think it was that situation where we first get introduced to Sara Himeji and the thing happened with that Kento guy. But she told him that that line that I just said where he is more popular than what he thinks he is. So don't try to get involved with 
some younger girl or some other girl or whatever. I, I don't know if you, if she was talking about Sara Himeji or talking about maybe like Miyori Mito or something like that when he did kind of have that interaction with her, but she told him that and I was like, that's definitely true. And he's kind of oblivious to it in a way. That's why she had to tell him like, hey, like don't leave these girls on or don't get too chummy with them because they might fall for you like in the situation with Koga potentially or even with the situation with Sada Hemeji we know that it kind of leads that way a little bit with the my student light novel that's upcoming yeah we know that things kind of happen with Sakta he's very nice to these girls and he knows how to interact with them makes them laugh and is very real with them he still you know has these girls that really do appreciate his companionship and some girls might think of it in that way like Maybe Sada Himeji thinks of it in that way and she like wants to be with him in some way or whatever, has a crush on him. But like Koga too, she had a crush on him too and she really liked him at that point. But yeah, very like good advice from Ryo Futaba that, like I said, he's very oblivious to, so he really needs to take that in mind and keep it in mind when it comes to interacting with different girls or like different students and stuff like this because don't get too chummy with these people because they might, you know, fall for you or whatever it may be and it might be a very awkward situation, whatever it may be. But seeing Ryo Futaba after the time skip was a great treat that we got. After all the tutoring stuff was done, Sakta ends up going back home and ends up seeing Kaede, but also has a happy surprise waiting there for him, and that is my Sakurajima. So we get to finally hear from her and see her in some fashion after the time skip and stuff, after the one and a half years that they kind of gone through and everything. And this was a happy surprise because she was supposed to be gone. She was supposed to be in a different prefecture of Japan filming or working in some fashion there, but she got done early and she came back and, you know, provided Sakta with the nice little surprise and everything. And we got to get that nice little banter between Sakata and my Sakatashima and her just, uh, you know, her cute dialogue and everything that she has. I believe at one point she was just like, Sakata called her cute and she's like, oh yeah, like I know I am or whatever, but it was just, you know, my Sakurajima thinks that we got from her, not in like a super stuck up ish way, but you know, just her acknowledging and taking that compliment and enjoying that compliment that Sakta was giving her. But yeah, it was nice seeing them interact and reading the dialogue that we got from my Sakurajima now that she's older and everything. Another thing that I did want to bring up was Toko Kirishima. So they did mention her throughout this light novel and get a little bit of something too that I'll bring up a little later with Toko Kirishima that is very, very important. And yeah, they did mention something along the lines of Toko Kirishima being a mysterious person and being a singer and everything and not really being able to see her face. There was like music videos going on with Toko Kirishima, like dancing and singing everything really beautifully, but her face was like blurred out or you can't see her face or anything like that. So it's still a mystery on who Toko Kirishima is. And there was rumors going around that my Sakurajima was Toko Kirishima. So people are thinking that my Sakurajima is the mysterious girl that has a beautiful voice and is getting more famous and everything like that. But finally, I'm going to touch on the sweet bullet stuff and the Yuzuki Hirokawa concerns and everything that are pretty much the main focus of this light novel here. So sweet bullet, they were going through some struggles and some uncertainties with their idol group because two of their idols graduated and when we say graduated we mean that they left the idol group so that's just a term that they kind of use within the kind of vtuber scene or idol scene or whatever it may be where they're leaving their current group that they're in or just stopping being a vtuber or stopping being an idol or whatever they call it graduating so two of their members i believe they had i think they had like seven members or something like that i can't remember the exact number but they had two members leave which is a big hit to their group dynamic because two of their friends are gone but also at the same time too two of their kind of idol group members are gone and now you know they have choreography and different things of that nature organization within their dances and their performances and everything and two of them are gone so now they have to potentially like shift that in a way to make it work with like two less people now. So that's gotta be a big change for them because you know, a lot of people have to change the way that they do things or organize it in a way that makes sense, space things out a little bit differently so it doesn't look so kind of empty potentially or whatever, but I'm sure that a lot goes into it when it comes to having those group members leave and having to kind of make up for it a little bit in a, of a way or change things to make it not look awkward or something like that. And it kind of brought a little bit of a morale letdown or morale 
morale kind of decrease for the group. And they also touched on their dream as an idol group because what did they really want out of this? Did they just want to become popular? Did they want this to turn into something that led to a different role, whether it be in acting or maybe get solo offers for each person or whatever it may have been? What did they really want out of it? And one of their dreams that they had or the main dream that they had was to perform at the Budokan, which is a huge historic arena that they have, which is very massive and they want to be able to perform there and have, you know, seats filled with people to very much so, you know, just enjoy it and have that big of a fan base to perform and have that kind of environment of performing at such a huge arena with so many people there just enjoying their music and everything. Like you have different groups like BTS or something like that when it comes to K-pop that do that as well where they're huge freaking massive in their music industry and everything and they perform at a bunch of different places or they did perform at a bunch of different places that are just massive and they have tons like millions of fans and everything out there. So that's what they wanna really do. They wanna get to that point where they're like big enough to perform at the Budokan and they gave us a little bit of a perspective as to like where they stand within idol groups. They say that they're probably around like maybe the 30th most popular idol group in Japan, which there's tons of idol groups out there. So in the grand scheme of things, it sounds very good considering like the situation that they're in and the kind of spot that they're at right now, the age that they're at. But yeah, it, it's not that great in the mind of Uzuki Hirokawa or maybe some of the other members because they want to be better. They want to be higher they like they don't want to feel stagnant and it kind of feels like that in a little bit of a way as being stagnant or you know getting people to come but they're not growing as fast as what they really want to be to get to that end goal that they have at the Budokan and it's a little bit like I said of a morale let down because they're in a little bit of a stagnant place and then as well as having those two members that they have leave so it changes things and Uzuki Hirokawa is very much so popular but they're at a point right now with their idol group where Uzuki Hirokawa is like the main focus of the idol group or like a lot of the fans go to their concerts and their events and everything for Uzuki Hirokawa. She's like the most bubbly, has a great personality and is probably like the best singer or whatever and performer that they have there. So she really stands out and people go there mainly for her. But the other girls there are really not really well known amongst like greater fans or whatever it may be. I'm sure like the diehard ones know them as well by name and stuff, but like the main like other fans or whatever that are, you know, may not be as diehard, they're there mainly for Uzuki Hirokawa and they want to change that. They want the group name of Sweet Bullet to be known on a larger scale than just being there for Uzuki Hirokawa. They want the group to be known, not just Uzuki Hirokawa, but also to perform at the Budokan one day. So yeah, that was just some good stuff that we got within it to see how their group dynamic is, to see how they, like what their dreams are and talking a lot more with those characters. And if you were a fan of Nadika, I'd say that this light novel would be great for you to read. Eventually, if you get to this point, you are definitely gonna enjoy it because there's a lot of Nadika in this. There's a lot of Uzuki Hirokawa in this talking amongst the idol group members and kind of overcoming obstacles and things of that nature too. Jumping over to some Uzuki Hirokawa stuff. So one thing that was going on and was a topic of conversation within this light novel too with her was her getting offers for solo work or there was rumors going around that Uzuki was going to go solo and get because she's been getting solo offers and things of that nature and that was definitely scaring the group members and and scaring some other people like Sakata because it's like hey like this group that they have there that they built it might all just go down in shambles if Uzuki Hirokawa decides like hey I'm a great singer I'm a great performer I'm gonna go and just do solo stuff and just do my own thing and just ditch the other girls which we know that she wouldn't do that but still it's a scary thought to have when we know that she has the talent to do something like that and the fact that she's getting real offers for this sort of opportunity now so this was definitely a difficult and nerve-wracking time for the group here and moving to a little bit more of personal things with Uzuki Hirokawa so one thing that did throw me off completely when I did see it or did read it was that Uzuki is going to university now so in-person university 
college, she is there. She is going to the Yokohama school as well, along with Sakata, along with my Sakajima, Miyori Mito, and Yukumi Akagi, and not like, like not to go all of them. So she's there along with all of them and everything in Sakata's attending classes and Uzuki Hirokawa is going there and talking to him. And like I mentioned earlier, Miyori Mito has some conversation with her too a little bit, kind of has some banter going back and forth and she's just her, her normal bubbly self, but this is where some problems kind of come in for Uzuki Hirokawa. Like I said, it was very different. It was very like caught me off guard when we did hear that she was there because before she had problems with interacting with people she really didn't fit in when it came to going to high school. And now we see her here in university in person and like the whole online school thing was very good for her and, and she liked it a lot. And now coming here, you know, there's no harm in trying things out, but it was different and I was like, there's some sort of thing going on as to why she's here. There's no re there's no way that she's just here just to try it out or just, I don't know, she just had a sudden change of heart, change of mind, like, hey, I'm gonna go to university in person now. And we see some other messed up stuff that was happening too with Uzuki with other girls making fun of her. So we know how Uzuki Hirokawa is. She's very bubbly. She doesn't read the room well, which is a big theme of this story that we have here. She just blurts things out or is very excited. She like screams across the room like, hey Sakata, what's going on or whatever, or hi or something like that. So it's a lot for some people. Some people might be like, oh, it's too early to have that sort of energy in the morning. Why are you being so loud or whatever? Just people trying to kill the mood or just to try to make a good person that's just trying to be happy feel bad, just trying to make them feel bad. And it sucks because Uzuki Hirokawa is such a fun, bubbly character that means no harm to these people. And these people just try to put her down or laugh or make fun of her behind her back or maybe, you know, just by the side of her and she just doesn't notice it or whatever because she can't really read the room. And that was something that was going on with this group of girls that was there like in that class with her and Sakta and everything, these girls were all in a little group and everything and they all dressed the same, they all really talked the same and they're just a group of girls that got along well that just almost looked like clones of each other. And it reminded me a lot of high school when it came to in real life because there's a bunch of kids that are in high school that go through fads and everything and these kids I don't know, maybe some kids even go to high school that have uniforms or whatever. So everybody looks the same in some sort of way. Or, you know, if they don't have uniforms, there's fads that go around school, like, hey, people wear cargo shorts all of a sudden in a black t-shirt. And that was just something that I saw personally a lot back in the day. Other people seeing like, hey, these people are all wearing baggy clothes. It's just a fad that goes around or girls that wear like poofy hair in some sort of way or, or something along those lines. But yeah, there's just, fads that do go around school and it's a reality of things. These girls kind of almost have that fad carrying on into this university and it's just something I believe that they kind of dive deeper into with Ryo Futaba and it was like almost kind of like hinting at like there was a kind of adolescent syndrome going on with something relating everybody or something like that. They said that there was an adolescent syndrome possibly affecting people on a mass scale and making it to where people are trying to be like each other or all trying to you know almost be clones of each other and stuff and there was these girls that group of girls or a different group of girls I believe where they all came into this one store or this one little restaurant or whatever it may have been and they all sat down and they all almost looked the same. And then there was another girl that came to them that was with the group, but she looked a little bit different. And then she took off her jacket or whatever. And then she was in the same type of clothes or whatever that all the other girls were in. So it was just a funny scene like, oh dang, we thought we found, we thought we found one <laughs> that was a little bit different that was breaking the mold or whatever. But no, she, she's just like all the other ones. Going back, I went on a long tangent but there's these girls that were all kind of in that sort of way. They were in that sort of group where they all dress like each other, talk to each other, talk about the same things and things like that. And Uzuki Hirokawa like was seemingly chummy with them and you know, kind of nice to them and they were nice to her in some sort of way. But you could tell that they were talking crap about her or making fun of her in some sort of way when she would leave without them or not be around them. I'm sure other people noticed it too. And Sakata didn't want to get too involved with it because he knows that she has to kind of handle these situations on her own. And there was a adolescent syndrome that popped up for Uzuki Hirokawa and that was her being able to read the room. And that caused for some genuine concern on Nadika's part 
and the other girl's part and then Sakata as well. You could see that when she would have different sorts of conversations with people, with Nadega, her group mates, or just other people, Sakata, she would respond in a certain way or she would be reading these people, like looking at them and noticing the way that they're interacting or their body language and stuff like that. And she would react to it or talk about things like in response to whatever reaction they may have had or whatever body language they may have been emitting or something like that. So it was different for people. It was different for Nautica and she was like really freaking out like what was going on with her? Like what's what's like going on with Uzuki? She's reading the room, what's happening to her? And she was so blown away by it. It's good that that happened because then she can read the room and notice that these bad girls or whatever that are in her school are talking crap about her, talking crap behind her back, because otherwise she wouldn't know that that's happening. And she's just, I don't know, I, I see it in two different ways. You know, you see it in the way of like, if she can't read the room, she doesn't ever acknowledge it and she's just happy and she's just her normal, nice, bubbly self and she just doesn't care or doesn't, you know, notice it at all. But at the same time too, you want to know, like she's probably just oblivious to the fact of it and just interacting with these girls thinking that they're her friends when they're really not. They're talking crap about her and everything behind her back. On the good side of it, you know, you have that awareness you have that ability to read the room and you can notice that these friends are not really friends they're people that are talking crap behind your back because they think that you're a little much or whatever it may be they think you're too loud or they think that you're too nice or too happy because people are weird and they don't like people that are happy sometimes it's just the reality of some situations with people in life and everything uzuki hirokawa was definitely different once this change did happen to her and she was going through this adolescent syndrome she was more weary of things and wasn't so bubbly she wasn't so energetic she still had conversations with all of her friends and she was still friends with everybody but she wasn't her old self and that was concerning to Sakata and that was concerning to like I said everybody involved really so it was sad to see her not be herself and not be energetic and bubbly and that real like fun character that we grew to love and still being on the topic of reading the room versus not being able to read the room one very sad scene that we did see from Uzuki Hirokawa was when her and Sakata were walking around somewhere I believe they're walking on campus for school and they saw Ikumi Akagi so she was there like handing out flyers for something or trying to get people's attention to get some of these flyers or to partake in whatever she had going on I can't remember exactly what it was but, you know, Sakta being the good person or Uzuki being the good person, I believe they walked up and grabbed the flyers that she had. So, you know, taking part in it or at least taking some interest in it in some fashion. But everybody else was just completely ignoring her. Some people were just laughing at her and, and things of that nature too. And it really hurt Uzuki Hirokawa because it was like, were those people that were laughing at her and making fun of her? laughing at me and making fun of me for being the way that she was being bubbly being fun being energetic and, and loud and everything the way that she is it was definitely like i said a sad scene that we got from her in that moment because she's coming to the realization of not everybody's being nice to you not everybody likes you and, and it sucks you know that she's not out there to hurt people she's not trying to harm anyone she's just trying to be fun she's trying to be happy she's trying to be with her friends and these other people just have some sort of problem with it or just jealous or whatever it may be they just don't want to they just don't like people being loud or they don't I don't know they don't like that sort of energy not everybody's gonna like you but it was just a situation where some people just don't want to see you happy and that's the kind of person that Uzuki Hirokawa is she is a very happy person and it was just like I said a very messed up scene almost made me kind of cry or whatever I was like dang it this sucks I feel bad for Uzuki with the situation with everything that was going on with her adolescent syndrome her not really being herself there became a lot of like rifts that were happening between the group Uzuki holding stuff back not telling the group members certain things where Uzuki would always tell her fellow group mates including Nadega especially she would always kind of be transparent with them and talk to them about stuff but there was certain times where she wasn't doing that and she was kind of being secretive and everything and there was multiple reports going out that Uzuki was going to be going solo and things of that nature too so it was all a big swirling pot of just like drama with Uzuki and with the sweet bullet idol group and everything and the uncertainty behind it what their future was looking like and having troubles with performances and things too like we had a performance that they had towards the end of the light novel where Uzuki Hirokawa 
she ends up losing her voice. She ends up like breaking down and everything and losing her voice and she couldn't sing anymore. But they kind of went with it uh, like pretty seamlessly and picked up after her, um, like Nantika and the other group mates. They ended up picking it up and knocking it out of the park. It was almost like that scene that we had in season one where Uzuki kind of stumbled and dropped her mic. But my Sakurajima came as Nautica and like grabbed it and made it like a very natural swift move to continue the song and didn't really miss a beat on anything. Uzuki had to leave at that point and they continued the song and everything and at that point when it happened I thought that it was another part of her adolescent syndrome and she was just not able to sing but that wasn't the case there. It was just a situation where she really just had a nervous breakdown kind of and she like couldn't sing the rest of the song and everything and she went to the hospital and they had to really monitor her and make sure that she was okay and stuff and I believe like pretty soon after they ended up having to try to figure something out with the group like hey how are we going to do this like we have things scheduled up in the near future on future performances and things like that so this was another problem that they had because Uzuki is a lot of the time the main focus the main driver for some of these fans to come to these events to come to these performances that they do have so her not being there might make it a little bit awkward one because of the dynamic of the group there are a certain amount of people in that group and they know each an individual person and Uzuki Hirokawa is at the forefront of that she is the group leader that they have so the group leader being gone is definitely going to be a little bit awkward it's going to be a little bit weird and have people wondering like hey what's going on why is the group leader not here she's always here whenever they have performances Uzuki Hirokawa is always there she always performs she said it herself like I haven't missed any of their performances that they've ever had so it just felt a little bit weird and it was kind of a question on like how will this turn out are they going to be able to do it without Izuki Hirokawa very big moment for them because it will show that they are able to do it without Uzuki Hirokawa and they are able to stand on their own two legs this group wouldn't be solely just a group that people would think of Uzuki Hirokawa on. They would think of this group more as a whole as, you know, not just Uzuki and with Nadaka and all these other girls and stuff too. I wanna to talk a little bit about Nadaka before I get to that. So Nadaka, like I said, is a very important part of this light novel. She has a lot more conversation, a lot more serious conversation with Sakata within the story, getting advice from him, uh, talking to my Sakurajima on certain parts too, and my Sakurajima kind of scolding her too when it comes to some of her problems that she has because my Sakurajima has dealt with various amounts of issues when it comes to the entertainment business and stuff. So she's kind of seen a lot of it. She's seen it all almost, or I'm, I'm sure she's seen a ton, like I said, but she kind of scolds her and like lets her know like, this isn't like too big of a deal or something too big for you to overcome. So why are you moping about it or something? So I like seeing those interactions between my kind of telling her like, hey, toughen up or whatever. But at the same time too, I liked seeing that side of Nautica with her being a little bit more worried and was great to see her concern for the group, concern for her friend in Uzuki, getting to see a lot more of Nautica, like definitely in this sort of situation and just a different side of her definitely moves her up in my rankings of, you know, characters and stuff. It makes me see her much more highly as a character within this series. She's not just some tsundere within the show that just gives Sakata a hard time. One thing that I almost forgot to mention when it came to Uzuki Hirokawa and the potential for going solo was that Uzuki Hirokawa did a cover for a Toko Kirishima song, so a solo performance cover for Toko Kirishima's song and it was done very beautifully. The way that they described it was very great and it really put her on the map if she wasn't already, at least more so than what she was before. It was something that really caught fire and became a viral video. Everybody was blown away by it. I believe even Kaide was like, whoa, what's going on? She's doing something amazing right now. And it was a, apparently a very beautiful song, like I said, so, and very much so kind of made it seem like, hey, she could really, really do this she could go solo if she really wanted to and it's something that maybe she might be open to because she went off and did a solo cover of a song and put it out there and it became a viral video that ended up coming out of it she it went so viral that she had to go in disguise when she wanted to go out even the next day to make sure that 
crazy people wouldn't like go after her or do anything bad like that because she you know it went so viral that she might be looked at as like a celebrity or something like that and there's another thing that i did want to touch on too with her and with sakata so there was a scene that was happening with sakata and nadika they were talking to each other or i can't remember what led up to it but they were talking to each other on the bullet train and they were about to get off and Nandaka was getting off of the bullet train and Sakata was as well but then he noticed that Uzuki Hirokawa was still on the bullet train or she was on the bullet train and he didn't even know that she was on there at all um, or maybe she had just got on but she was there so he ran and jumped back onto the bullet train which was funny because he like kind of just ditched Nandaka there at the moment when that happened I was like oh it's no worries he could just text her, you know, he could call her or text her or whatever, but I completely forgot that he didn't have a phone. So yeah, that was one thing that did happen there that I thought was funny. I was like, oh yeah, yeah, he doesn't have a phone, so he can't even do that. So he was hoping that Navika was just like, oh yeah, it was just a normal thing or she would just blow it off or whatever, not think too much of it. So he wanted to find out where she was going and see and kind of ask her if she was really okay, kind of probe her for questions to find out if she was like really really okay instead of her just maybe potentially lying or putting on a straight face or whatever for people that are asking her these potential questions and stuff so he followed her or at least went on the train and was waiting till she got off to see where she was actually headed and she ended up taking the bullet train i believe all the way to the very end of the like the route that the bullet train takes so at the very end of it they ended up getting off and he you know walks up to her and he's like hey like what's going on like what are you doing over here and she is like whoa like what are you doing over here why are you here <laughs> like following me or whatever and they ended up just kind of hanging out with each other i believe they got some food together and ate some food and it was really nice had some conversation and then at some point too they kind of got on to the topic of the people that are like jealous of her or why are these people like mean and everything like that in this world and things of that nature and and her now having this adolescent syndrome and now being able to read the room like her noticing people having snide remarks or whatever towards her when it came to the idol group stuff so people that might be jealous of her or might be having a bad day and they're taking it out on her or whatever they're saying things like how long are you gonna do that idol thing you know like almost in a way of like telling her to stop or like them being mad that that she's doing that and it's you know such a not a good thing to say like in the way that they were saying it to her it was like in a way of like i said them being mad at her for doing something very great like them potentially being jealous and sakata gave it to her straight and was telling her like these people don't have what what you have the talent and the career that you have going for you with being an idol group member and having the potential for going solo and things of that nature so him telling her like these people are potentially jealous they don't have those sorts of things don't listen to those sorts of people that are telling you that but it's still sad that these people do say that and it was something that really put doubt in her mind of like hey this idol thing is probably not going to go on for a super long time you know idol group members kind of their careers kind of go away really quick or it's not something that you can carry on into your 30s or 40s they want you to be pretty and young and whatever it was something that really propped up a lot of doubts within her and that Sakata really gained out of the conversation of she didn't believe in herself she didn't believe in the group she didn't believe that they can make it to the budokan and it all really made sense because there was so much stuff that was going on with the group members leaving and with the kind of growth of their group being stagnant and all these things happening like one after another it was just something that was popping up in her head potentially on what was going on like i said with things failing for them and it wasn't going to go well so she was going there to kind of find herself potentially when she went to that very far place so i believe that they went on a bike ride to like a daikon flower bed or something like that and they were biking around and just the way that they described it just sounded so beautiful and it was something that i really want to see in a potential animated form and see something like that in real life too with the great scenery like that where they were just biking around and seeing the ocean off in the distance and just being in around such beautiful scenery and everything out in the real world so i was like dang man i, I can't believe it like they're describing this in such a beautiful way like i would love to experience and see that in person too i'm sure that there's like wind blowing in their hair and just made it feel really nice out there so it was just a really nice description 
of their trip that they really had and just having more of that conversation there. And one thing I did want to mention too was that now that Uzuki Hirokawa can read the room, she was able to have a lot better of conversations with Sakata and had a lot better of witty banter between the two. Even at some point she asked Sakata, this is adolescent syndrome, right? And he was like, yeah, like probably. <laughs> and she was like, well, if this gets resolved and everything, I'm gonna go back to the way that I was. And he was like, yeah, most likely you will. And she was like, oh, that kind of sucks because she likes having that witty banter or repartee, the way that she phrased it, between her and Sakata like that because it, it's just a nice like change that she wasn't able to really experience before because she wasn't able to read the room, but now she's able to read the room and she's able to pick up on certain things, certain cues, and respond in a witty manner and keep that kind of like funny kind of conversation and banter going with him. And a lot of that happens with Sakata as he does with other characters do, we know that. It was just such a, you know, a sad thing that she realized that was gonna happen once she does resolve whatever was going on with her. She kind of felt better after it, you know, after that little trip and stuff, and she like did that big stretch and everything like you see in the picture and stuff that we've gotten in one of the visuals from from that light novel which was which was really nice but at the same time too we knew that things weren't really all the way resolved I believe at the end of that conversation and stuff in that little trip Sakata was like yeah like we can still tell that the smile that she was giving was kind of fake it wasn't a genuine smile I believe they went and met Nautica at the Budokan or something like that I believe that they went to the Budokan but I know that they visited it on that trip there. So she went there with Sakata and you know, they were looking at the Budokan like, hey, this is our, like our goal here. Like this is something that they're striving for. And all those doubts and stuff that she had in her mind of like, hey, like this isn't gonna work out. They're gonna fail. They're not gonna go to the Budokan and perform there. Uh, but also at the same time too, knowing that like, hey, like this is the place where we want to go. We have to fill all of these seats. We gotta get big enough to get to this point really nailing it in our heads of like how much more work they have to do to get to that point to perform at the Budokan. Another thing that I almost forgot to mention was that Kaide is so much more independent now and it almost feels surprising of how much she's progressed when it comes to her previous adolescent syndrome and stuff. She'll just go and walk outside and be like, hey, I'm leaving or whatever and it's just no big deal. Or just her, like right now, she is working. She has a job and she's working at the restaurant that Sakata was working at too or that he is currently still working at. So she works alongside Sakata and works with Koga as well. And she's uh, pretty good friends with Koga now. She has some like conversations with her and chats it up with her as well when she's working there. So that's pretty cool now that she's actually working and things are a lot more comfortable for her. And it's crazy to think about how far she's come considering how she was back in the day with not being able to even step outside or talk to anybody else other than Sakata, let alone just walking outside, you know, so easily or being so fine with being on her phone all the time now and connected to the internet and social media and everything. And then going and working somewhere too where she has to regularly interact with people. That's definitely good practice to get back into the real world where you get practice with talking to people on a regular basis. So that's good. Like I said, it threw me for a loop. I was like, whoa, she's doing all of this now. This is really crazy. It, it like made me think about it a lot more of like where she was before and how far she's come. So that was uh, definitely good to see. But jumping back over to the tail end of this light novel, the best parts of this light novel, which was the performance that they had at this other place. I can't remember exactly where it was at, but they did perform without Uzuki Hirokawa and the build up to it was very nerve wracking. They knew that this was a big moment for them and that it was gonna be a tough thing, but they also believed in themselves that this was gonna work out that they could do this. They, they were going to make sure that Uzuki didn't have anything to worry about and that they were gonna power through and knock this out of the park. And when they got to the location and had everything set up and all the fans were there, they really addressed the elephant in the room but in a really nice natural way for their group because they always have that nice little witty dialogue with each other and playfulness and everything with each other too. So once they kind of talked about it, they're like, hey, Uzuki's not here. This is gonna be a little bit tough, you know? And some of the other girls were like, oh yeah, like her parts in her, the songs and stuff are always so hard to sing, like, oh my gosh. And yeah, they were just kind of making it very lighthearted and very funny of a moment that was happening. Not funny making fun of Uzuki, but 
funny in the way of like them having to perform without her and everything and gives off that vibe that they always usually have with their fans and with each other. So it made it a lot more comfortable for the fans that were there. And then they started performing and everything seemed to be going smoothly for the most part. Everything was going well choreography wise, the way that they described it, I guess, seemed pretty well, at least from the extent that they did give us there. And the fans were pretty going pretty crazy and stuff at some points too. But then a little progressively, these fans started dwindling away. Some of them were wanting to see Uzuki Hirokawa. Some of them were just people that were there for her because of the music video that she had with the Toko Kirishima cover. So once they found out that the Toko Kirishima cover girl that performed it wasn't there, they were just deciding to leave and everything too. So it, it was just kind of progressively getting worse. And then it started raining at that too. So it made things even worse at that point. And then their speakers and stuff went off and shut off too. So it was just one thing after another, another hurdle after another. Sakata was there there at the event, he ended up attending that and then as well as finding out that Uzuki Hirokawa she was there as well. So she was watching it, but in disguise. And we know that she had that whole like voice dying situation where her voice went out or whatever. She couldn't really sing because of that like nervous breakdown stuff that she was going through. So she was there and like she said before, and I think I mentioned it earlier, like she said, I have never missed a Sweet Bullet concert ever. So she wasn't going to miss this one either. So she was there. And of course, I'm sure that she was nervous at how this was going to play out for this group here without her being there and singing and stuff and performing. So she was there very nervous and Sakata found her and was talking to her and, and he was like, you come here often? And she was like, shut up or whatever. She was very nervous for the situation as she should be because they have never performed without her. And all these things were just going wrong for that type of situation. But it very much so showed their resolve and showed that they really love what they do and that they believe in themselves and that they want this to work and everything too because even though all this stuff was happening, the rain was happening, storming and stuff, and all their like electrical stuff just went out so they can't really sing loudly on the mics and everything, they still pulled together and sung very, very loudly, like they sung their hearts out and stuff without the mics, which was a very, very powerful moment for it, and I can't wait to see this animated. Like I said, this is gonna be like such a good scene when they do animate it. Hearing the music and seeing the choreography and everything, seeing all of these hurdles that they have to go through all these things one after another going wrong and then them still having the courage having the resolve to just continue it and keep going even though all these things are going wrong for them and seeing their resolve pushed Uzuki Hirokawa to go up there and to sing along with them which was a great scene and they welcomed her with open arms of course and they kind of finished the song and everything and finished their little concert that they had with them and it was just such a really good moment for Uzuki and good for their group and really brought them all back together and made that bond with them all that much stronger than what it was before and it was kind of like the ending piece for Uzuki Hirokawa's adolescent syndrome that she had going on with her and she announced something at the end of this concert too to all of her fans. She said that she was going to be going solo and that she was going to also stay with the group. So she was going to be doing both of those things. She showed it before in that Toku Kirishima cover. She has what it takes to become a solo artist. And then she was going to stay with her group because of course she loves her friends and loves the group and loves that sort of atmosphere and stuff too. That sort of dynamic that they have with the idol group. She's not going to just walk away from it. At first when they announced it or whatever said that she was going to be going solo they said that at first and I was like what there's no way she's going to just abandon her friends or whatever in in the group and stuff but I had to read just a little bit further to find out that she's going to do both of those things so going to be a lot on her plate for sure when it comes to her work she's going to be doing solo stuff making her own music whatever it may be and then doing the idol stuff on top of that and then other little events that they do have to partake in for their group a very very great scene I come I loved it so much reading that part of it it was so powerful even with reading it out of a book like that in the light novel but moving on to the last portions of the story where we find out a little bit more where Uzuki Hirokawa decides that she's going to leave university and like I said in the very beginning or kind of towards the beginning was that it was very strange that she was there in the first place I knew that there was something up with what was going on 
with her being at university, it just seemed so strange that she was there and out of place because before she was in online school and it seemed like it was such a good thing for her and she seemed like she wasn't the type of person that thrived in this sort of environment being in an in-school, like in-person type of schooling situation like that. And even with Sakata, I believe he asked her before, like, why did you decide to choose the major that you're going into and go to the Yokohama school. And, and she just kind of like rebuttaled back of like, or responded back saying like, why did you? And then she was like, I'm just gonna go with whatever you just said right now. So she never really addressed it up until this point. She decided to go to school. I believe I mentioned it earlier that she wanted to go here because she wanted to understand what her fellow groupmates go through on a daily basis. She wanted to understand them more, but then that led to her going to school meeting these people that she you know liked to hang out with and interact with and stuff and she wanted to kind of like be like and she got kind of like sucked into this situation where she was with all of these girls who all dress like each other and talk about the same things and go on social media and, and look at the same types of things and she ended up getting sucked into that and becoming a little bit more like them with dressing like them as well and kind of being able to read the room like they're able to read the room too so that's what led to her adolescent syndrome at that stemming from mostly her wanting to help her friends or help herself understand her friends better with all of this resolve and stuff and her feeling better and more comfortable with things her graduating from university not actually graduating but like leaving university almost like in the way of saying like she's graduating from an idol group or graduating from being a vtuber or something like that she graduated from university by leaving essentially so i like how they phrase that there at the end or at least sakata did he kind of gave a heartfelt goodbye and like congratulations to her saying like congrats and uh good job for for graduating which was a very very nice scene i i loved hearing the description of Sakata kind of displaying his feelings for Zuki Hirokawa in the way of like, he's proud of her and he's gonna miss her bubbliness and stuff being around campus and stuff. Seeing everything that happened with her and her adolescent syndrome was really, really roller coaster of emotions and stuff. And kind of sad that she's not able to really read the room in the way that she was before like this because like i said reading the room is beneficial you can you know notice the things that people are saying behind your back potentially or noticing like kind of quirks or how people react to things or their kind of body language and stuff and be able to react or respond in an appropriate manner but they did mention it though that she didn't completely regress and go back to the way that she was she's able to read the room but a little bit more delayed like it's a little delayed like she will get it and understand it a little later than what most people would but she's still back to her bubbly self and kind of is a little bit oblivious to what's uh, going on in the moment she doesn't get that stuff and read the room live she realizes it a little bit later is the way that they kind of explained it which is cool because i was like wondering, like I said before, like it's a good thing to be able to read the room. It's gonna suck if she goes back and regresses completely and isn't able to read the room. But now they addressed it and they're like, yeah, like she's able to read the room, but not in a live situation. She can still, you know, realize what's going on, but maybe at a later time or whatever. But she ended up just leaving at that point and they said their goodbyes, got a little handshake from Sakata and he told her congratulations and everything and she ended up leaving and before she completely left she like jumped up and down and gave like a really like happy like wave and goodbye and said goodbye to Sakata and everything and she was like super happy and stuff and even though all those people around her were probably like cringing and saying like oh it's too early to be that loud like it was such a good scene like she just didn't care that that was happening that was a moment where you could see that she wasn't reading the room in that situation which was, you know, those situations that we love out of her. Her being bubbly, her being fun, her being loud and energetic and stuff like that, having those positive vibes and everything. And Sakata reciprocated that by doing the same thing, being loud and being super happy and saying bye back to her. And I loved him being there for her in that sort of situation. And he didn't care that those other people were probably looking at him all strange or saying mean things about him for doing that. He, you know, reciprocated that and because it's his friend, he wants to support her and he's happy for her at the end of the day, which is a really, really great scene. I love the end of this light novel. And then going on to this part of it that was probably the most stunning part of it too, because it hints at towards the end of this series, which is a very important, very important scene, which is why I made a video about this topic in the first place with the whole Toko Kirishima thing and 
her being like the woman behind the curtains when it comes to this series for the Rascal Does Not Dream series. And that is at the end of this, when she ends up walking away, there's somebody that does say something at the end of it. They walk up like by Sakata and they're like, oh, like such a shame after I let her read the room. And Sakata was like, whoa, what the heck is going on? Like, who's saying this? Like some random woman or whatever. And I was thinking the exact same thing. I was like, I read it for just a second when like you could watch it in my live stream that I had. Like I said it and read it and I was like, I had to do a double take. I was like, wait, what did she just say? Like, what the fuck? That was, that was such a weird thing to say, like from somebody just random coming up to him. Who would say that? It, it was just such a weird phrase or whatever, just statement. And it was Toko Kitashima. So Toko Kitashima comes into the forefront of the story now and meets Sakata officially. I guess we get to see her in kind of full form in the 13th light novel. But at this point, Sakata actually gets to see her, sees her face, and she's dressed in the Santa Claus outfit. That was what really gave it away that this was Toko Kitashima. She seems like she knows him, but he doesn't know her. And she lets him know like, oh, like I know you or whatever, even though they haven't really met. She knows of him and there's big theories and stuff out there, at least on my part, I haven't seen anybody else talk about it really other than some people that chat about it with me like in chat or something or in Discord or whatever. It makes it heavily implied that she is the person that's potentially causing for adolescent syndrome to happen in the first place because she says, I'm the one that let her read the room. The reason why that she was able to read the room was due to adolescent syndrome. So is her saying that she gave her the adolescent syndrome, she bestowed adolescent syndrome upon her. So it bodes the question, was she the reason or was she the person that potentially bestowed adolescent syndrome onto all of these other characters that we know? My Sakurajima, Sakata, Kaede, all of these other people, what are her intentions with this? And she is the character that I am most excited to hear about, to learn about, to read about, because once we get more information on her, we're going to learn more, I'm assuming, as to what the core of adolescent syndrome really is and get that end game level information or get that end game level, you know, just events in general when it comes to this story. Because if we find out the core of what adolescent syndrome is, potentially the person who is bestowing adolescent syndrome upon these characters, then that's end game level stuff. You know, we know that adolescent syndrome is an uncommon like an, an unnatural thing that does happen in this world. A lot of people believe it is myth or whatever. It's just urban legend or they don't really believe that it happens. And like I said, they portray it in that certain way and the fact that it's happening and we know that she said this certain thing. And if we find out the core of it and the person that's possibly behind it, then that's just going to be end game level stuff if they figure out what's going on or are able to get rid of adolescent syndrome in some sort of way. That's, you know, the big theme behind this series. And that's gonna be the end of the series once they end up doing that sort of thing. So that'll be crazy when that ends up happening or once we get more information on Toku Kirishima. I'm excited for it. I'm here for it, like I said, but that was, the end of the light novel. Great read, absolutely banger read. I loved it. Like I said, I love the more mature feeling of it, but still kept that core feeling of the Rascal Does Not Dream series with a lot of the witty banter and seeing all the characters that we know and love like Sakata, Ryo Futaba, Mai Sakurajima, Uzuki Hirokawa, getting to see the perspective from her and her worries and having to see her overcome things and her dynamic between her and her friends and Nadaka, the people in her idol group and getting to see her mental state on what she thinks about her career, her future with being an idol, her doubts with being an idol and in that idol group and stuff and having to regain her faith in being in that idol group and believing that they're going to go to the Budokan and grow as an idol group and get better and everything. It was, it was just a great read overall. Getting to hear more about Miyori Mito as a character, seeing the new characters, getting set up for the My Student stuff in the 12th Light novel with getting introduced to Sara Himeji and then getting to see a little bit more of Ikumi Akagi, but that's gonna be the main focus in the next Light novel with Ikumi Akagi. Can't wait to see that. But overall, I'd probably g I'd give the light novel a 10 out of 10, especially for the ending of the light novel. It was absolutely great. Loved it with the Uzuki Hirokawa stuff and then with the Toku Kirishima stuff as well. It was awesome. But yeah, that was just my thoughts on it. I'm sorry if I was a little bit jumpy with the events that did happen with this, but there's just so many things that I did want to discuss with this light novel and get my thoughts on. I hope you all enjoyed the video. Enjoy me spewing out all kinds of stuff about the series and just enjoying it and having 
having the conversation and whatnot. But yeah, hope you all enjoyed it. Make sure to leave a comment down below on what you thought of the light novel, if you guys did read it, on what you think of this, if you agree on some of the theories that I had or whatever it may be, or just some of the things that I did have to say about the light novel. Let me know what you guys think. I'd greatly appreciate it. And also make sure to like the video. I'd greatly appreciate that too. And make sure to subscribe as well. That'd be freaking awesome. And make sure to hit that notification bell as well to get notified for whenever I do upload a video, go live or do any fun things like that. I hope you all have a fantastic blessed day and I will catch you all later. See ya. Bye-bye.